Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Brethren in Christ, Laudato Jesus Christus. This is Timothy S. Flanders. This is the meaning of Catholic. Today we're going to talk about the history of Catholic politics. We're trying to attack politics and give Catholics as much as possible the objective principles that we you need to vote in your elections and um, sh- usher in Christ the King, the, the social kingship of Christ, as much as you can in your political situation that you're in, whatever country you are in. So we're going to talk more about that in the t- coming weeks. We're going to talk about the history today. Um, but first, I wanted to address a moral theology question somebody asked about gaming and gambling. Is it okay to gamble as a Catholic? Um, so in Prumer, he basically says yes and no. Um, it depends on the exact character and the purpose and the intent of gambling. Um, and so he lays it out like this. Um, <clears throat> He says, bets, betting, is lawful provided, one, uh, bets are made for a lawfully good purpose, and they are laid laid upon a suitable object, namely something lawful and uncertain for both parties. So he's saying that you can do it for a morally good purpose. Now, the morally good purpose is the virtue of eutropelia, which is right recreation. So when we put stakes on something just for recreation purposes, that is the good intent. That's the moral, morally good purpose that uh, Prumer is getting at here. When he talks about gaming as opposed to betting, kind of related but not this exactly the same, he says the purpose of gaming must be lawful recreation. Um, so he's trying to distinguish between um, – when you get addicted to gambling, you're trying to just win more money. You get addicted to this this chance of getting more money. And so there is a very strong danger in gambling, just like alcohol or tobacco or other things that can be used with moderation, but there is an addictive element. So we need to be careful and have moderation there. Um, now he talks about, he does, Prumer actually says that um, if you're not doing it purely for recreation, it has to be basically your salary. Um, So he's kind of talking about professional gamblers, I guess. But um, he talks about, he he lays out these five principles, these conditions wherein games uh, played for stakes can be lawful. Um, Here's the conditions that he gives. He says, one, the players must be free to dispose of the stakes for which they are to gamble. Um, Two, the gamble is undertaken with full knowledge and consent. Three, the players must have a morally equal chance of winning. Four, all fraud must be excluded. Five, gain must not be the chief motives of the game, neither must it be sought after too eagerly. So um, it seems, even though he's, it seems to allow sort of a professional gambling as a, as a salary, um, but he also says that the, the gain must not be the chief motive. And what I take him to mean here is uh, avarice, basically the vice of avarice, where you're always trying to seek more money and more gain um, which is causing your ruin. So the vice of avarice obviously is a vice. It's a sin. The love of money is the root of all sin, um, or all kinds of evil, that is. Um, so take keeping that in mind in that um, you're not becoming addicted, it does indicate here in Prumer that gambling per se is not evil. So it's not an intrinsically evil, but it is something that's very dangerous. You need to be careful, just like when you drink alcohol, you need to have that moderation. So um, that's what Prumer says. That's from uh, number 359 and 360. Um, If you go on the Moral Theology resources, there's a link below. It'll have a few free PDFs of this text. so that the, the page number is 163, if you want to look that up and read more about that. Um, so let's talk about Catholic politics. Um, now, if you go back and read the video or watch the video, we tried to talk about Catholic social teaching non-negotiables. And in that video, we tried to nail down what are the basic non-negotiables. So, so what I want to do is rehash some of those real quick and then try to step through some of the history. I'm not sure if we'll get through all the history today. We might need to do two parts of it. 
Um, but this is going to be uh, an overview. So it's going to be a general picture. There's going to be a lot of things left out just by necessity. We're going to try to do this in an hour. So any people who know history, feel free to comment and add any particular details that we missed in this whole podcast. So um, let's see. So first I wanted to quick talk about recommended books. I'm going to provide a link to the website will I have links to recommended books to dig deeper into these questions. Um, one of the biggest books I would recommend is this book called The Framework of a Christian State by E. Cahill. Um, now Cahill, this is published in 1930. He was one of those good Jesuits that still existed back then. And uh, it's a really great overview of some history, some basic political principles, um, basic interactions between the Christian state and uh, the modern world. And it's really a great textbook. Um, It's again, it's published by Roman Catholic books. Um, So I would recommend taking a look at this. This is one of the best books out there, I think on this. Um, And then you can also pick up a book just with all the modern encyclicals that are are addressing a lot of the social questions. Um, I have, this one is, called Catholic Social Thought, published by Orbis Books, um, published in 1992. Uh, so this one has uh, Rebrum Novarum, 1891. It has um, Centesimos Annos, um, or Quadriesimos Annos, um, from Pius the Eleventh, And then it goes through the, the more modern encyclicals from John the Twenty-Third, and it goes through Paul the Sixth, John Paul II. Um, so... We're going to get into that. That's really the question of the modern world is really, in my opinion, one of the the crucial points where Catholics divide. Um, And there are there are points where Catholics can divide and there are points where Catholics cannot divide. And that's kind of what we try to get into. Um, Another book I want to recommend, too, is uh, Christopher Ferrara, Liberty, the God that Failed. Um, This book is a critique of the American Republic. Um, so what I would recommend is also taking another, uh, book to balance this and to look at both sides of the issue because America's America in many ways really is the hinge point upon which the Catholics divide, um, in the, in the Vatican too, because, um, they're the, basically the, the issue is how does the Catholic world deal with the modern secular Republic? Um, and, uh, the other, another Recent work is by Timothy Gordon. He wrote Catholic Republic, which was a pro, was a, basically a defense of the American Republic from a Catholic perspective. So you can take a look at that book that defends America and the American principles. So um, those are some books, and take a look at the link. There's a there's a few more books there. Um, but let's. I just want to rehash real quick some of the basic principles that we talked about. Um, so. All of Catholic political history can kind of be boiled down, in my opinion, to uh, church and state, basically, a wrestling between church and state and a wrestling to conform the state to Christ's rule and conform the laws, the laws of the state to the rule of Christ so that these laws are moral according to the law of God. So that's kind of the basic tension that goes on for the entire history. Um, And I want to real quick, so we'll talk about the the most basic principle really is that Christ is king. Christ is the king, Mary is the queen, and all laws of every nation have to conform to Christ the king. There cannot be immoral laws that are against the law of God. And that's the basic principle of Catholic politics right there. Um, There is no sphere where Christ is not Lord. There is no area where Christ is not king and where his rule should not be felt because he's ruler over all. And so that's the basic concept. And then we also touched in the video of there's basically three forms of government that the church can accept. Um, One is monarchy. Two is oligarchy, which is where basically the elites, a group of elites, rule. And then there's the republic, which is more democratic, where there's a lot more... um, popular vote uh, deciding things and deciding laws and rulers. And so kind of everything in between there is acceptable. But then we talked about the extremes where we talked about, on the one hand, this collectivism or communism, which is where the state takes control of all property and then redistributes it. And then there's objectivism, which is where each individual is sort of their own 
their own Lord with sovereignty over themselves. Uh, it is a virtue to be selfish. Uh, both of those extremes are incompatible with Catholic social thought. No Catholic can be a communist or an objectivist. Um, the basic social unit of, the, of society is the family, and laws must be promulgated which benefit the family, benefit uh, mother, father, and children in one family. And so we talked about subsidiarity, which was the principle that the lower, more, the closer form of government must be the one to handle problems, meaning uh, the local ruler who is the lo- you know the, your local municipality if you live in a city you've got a you've got a mayor so the mayor should be the one handling most of the issues unless he can't do it then the governor should do it then the president or the uh, higher authority so that's a subsidiarity but then we talked also about if you take subsidiarity to its extreme then you you kind of end up with objectivism as well so that 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 one individual atomized piece um, but then there's also talked about the four sins that cry to heaven for vengeance and that kind of forms this four uh four pronged attack on reforming society in a christian image so one is willful murder and we'll talk about ways that this was attacked in the beginning there's also the sin of sodomy um so then both of those obviously go against the family because the family uh cannot murder its children um sodomy is against the basic um, command to become a family. Um, the third one is oppression of the poor, and that's obviously against the family because the poor family cannot thrive and and do save their souls and if they're starving, if they're if they're dying, you know. And then the fourth one is defrauding laborers of their wages. And so if you're not paying your wages to the father of the family, the uh, mother, if she has to work, you know, the, the father and the, uh, the family cannot survive if they're not paid a just wage. And so, so those four things um, come into play. So basically, the, the history of Catholic politics can kind of be, I'm going to boil it down into three periods. The first period is the early church, and that goes from the death of our Lord from Pentecost to the year 301, which is when Armenia becomes a Christian state. So 301, and then in 380 is when the Roman Empire becomes officially a Christian state. So that that, that period is when the early church, there is no Christian state, there is no Christian rule, um, there are just Christians, and we'll talk about that. And then this, the second period is really the Christian state period, which can stretch basically from around 300 to around 1789. So we could just say 300 to 1800, basically, where um, during these 1500 years, the basic Catholic political model was the Catholic state, the Christian state, which is where the ruler acknowledged the authority of Christ the King. He strove, ideally, to uh, pattern his laws after the law of God, and the church and state had a close relationship, and we'll talk about that. Um, So then at around 1800, that's when the world begins to change dramatically in terms of politics. Um, So you have 1776, 1789, 1798. There's these three different revolutions which change the face of the Catholic political sphere. So that's when the modern secular state is basically born. And through a series of revolutions, um, begins to completely dominate the world of politics. And now in our day today, the modern secular Republican state is the dominant government model of all states. And so we're living in this period where the modern secular state is what dominates everything. And so now we're in this period. So as you can see, the, the most dominant form throughout church history is really this Christian state. And so we'll talk about that. So um, so in the beginning, the early church, so in this first period, you have the Christians, and the Christians pledge allegiance to the emperor, but they refuse to burn incense to the emperor. And so it represents this basic principle of the church and state, which are distinguished but not separated. And that's the... the basic principle, distinguished but not separated. So there is a distinct power between the church and the state. So the Christians were willing to pledge allegiance. They were willing to be soldiers in the empire. They were willing to fight in the emperor's wars. 
but they were not willing to burn incense to Caesar as God. And so when that point happened, that's when they became martyrs. And so that was the view of the early Christian church. So they were, they were praying for the emperor. They were being Roman citizens. Um, so, but they, they would not confess that Caesar is God. And because of the way that the gospel was presented. Now, an important thing that needs to be understood is the early gospel writings were patterned after the political propaganda of the time. So the Roman em- emperor was called Lord, the Son of God. He proclaimed a gospel, which was peace on earth. That was his gospel. So the, the emperor would come to town or the, the herald would come to town and he would proclaim the gospel of Caesar Augustus, the Son of God, the Lord, who has brought peace to the world and to men of goodwill and all that. So they would use these phrases because their propaganda was to prop up this demigod, this sort of semi-divine emperor who was the son of God and he was the one bringing peace to the world. And that was the idea in the Roman political propaganda. So the Christians come along and they have a different gospel. Their gospel is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he is the Lord, and he is the one who brought peace to the world and brings peace to this world. And so that's why, in particular, the the Christian message was so subversive politically because it basically adopted these Roman patterns of propaganda and turned them on their head and paid homage to a different Lord and a different Son of God. But the Christians were also taking pains to try to show that they were not trying to cause a revolution politically per se. They were not trying to overthrow the Roman empire. They were just trying to make the Roman empire pay allegiance to Christ the King. So that is really the difference is that they were willing to be Roman citizens. They just wanted the Roman empire to pay homage to the real King. So, That is the period, basically, of the early church, 33 to 301. And so during this period, the early church uh, has its own controversies, um, but they confessed Christ as king. They struggle against the persecutions. They become martyrs. The faith grows. Uh, Tertullian says that the, um, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, and so the, the martyrs, the cult of the martyrs is um, spreads where it inspires and, and grows the faith. Um, there are some who take, there are some quotes from Tertullian who, who basically says, now Tertullian is basically a church father, but he's not a saint. He died a heretic. A lot of his writings are accepted, um, but he did die a heretic, and so he's not a saint, and so he's not a true father of the church, but much of his writings are respected and used. Uh, but there are some writings from Tertullian which say that Christians should not fight in the Roman uh, army. They should not uh, be a part of the Roman Empire in that sense. And so some Christians, like Protestant groups, are kind of take this mindset where the Christian state cannot exist. Uh, It is uh, inimical to the gospel. Um, They're basically Christian anarchists. And this is not really the the mindset of the early church because because the biggest counterexample of this is the cult of the soldier saints. So one of the biggest cults is the cult of St. George, who was a soldier who was a martyr. And so he fought in the Roman Empire. Uh, He fought for the Roman Empire. He fought in the Roman army. And he became a martyr because he refused to pay his divine honor to the emperor, but he was willing to fight in their wars. And so the cult of these soldier saints shows that the church loved even these soldiers. So the church accepted the, the Roman Empire as a, a, as a providential political program, so a political entity. So the church accepted that, and, you know, the church recognized that it was because St. Paul was a Roman citizen, and because of the vast networks of roads that the Roman Empire had had already built, that St. Paul was able to preach the gospel and, and, and spread this gospel around and create these bishops all over the Roman Empire. 
So, but what's interesting is around this time and around 300, so the, the kingdom of Armenia becomes Catholic. Now, Armenia was outside the Roman Empire. And here's where there's, we begin to see a tension between the politics of the earth and the politics of the kingdom of God. And what I mean by that is because here's the difference, the, the difference between Catholicism and Mohammedanism. So Mohammedanism creates one political entity because it's the, it's centered in the Caliph where there are successors of Muhammad, the false prophet, and they create one political identity so that there, there is not a distinction without separation. There is no distinction and no separation. Um, so the, it means that the political leader is the same person as the religious leader. And so there is only one political allegiance. So therefore, the, the Mohammedans spread their empire later when they invade. They spread their empire, and they, you have the rightly guided caliph, El Rashidun, um, and they are the one political entity. And then there's different divisions of them. But the difference with the Christian concept is that the church and state, there is a distinction without a separation. And so the church can exist in the kingdom of Armenia, and Armenia can be a Christian state, and the Roman Empire can be a Christian state. And they can be at peace with one another because the, the religion is not based on one political entity uniting all. And so this, but this tension between the political politics of the earth, between the state of Armenia and the state of our Roman Empire, that concept is going to be really the source of a lot of division among Christians during the first millennium. Because what you had was, uh, so 301, Armenia becomes Catholic. 380 is when the Theodosius I, the emperor, proclaims Christianity to be the religion of the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire becomes a Christian state, officially. And so this tension begins to be felt uh, very soon because there are these heretical movements where these emperors are heretics and they're trying to push on this heresy and the church is struggling against them. But before we get into that, I want to pause and talk about the social issues of the day because we talked about those four different sins that credit heaven for vengeance. And so very soon the, the, the social mores and the laws are being abolished, which previously allowed evil customs. So first of all, idolatry is abolished. Uh, no, no man is allowed to pay homage to demons, to demon gods. And this is where the idea of religious liberty is very foreign to the early church. They did not understand that a man should have liberty to worship the demons. They believed that these, these idols and these temples should be destroyed and they should be rededicated to God and the saints. And so there wasn't this idea that we just sort of had this freedom in, innately to choose whatever religion we please. So idolatry was crushed, but there's also these social questions we talked about. So abortion was illegalized. You know, before that, they did perform abortions in the Roman Empire. Um, they performed infanticide. Um, there was also wife murder. So a Roman father could kill his wife and children lawfully in the Roman Empire before the dawn of Christianity. So that was completely abolished. Obviously, you can't you, there can that's the number one sin that Christ of heaven for vengeance is willful murder. And so the any type of um, the cult prostitution, the cult um, sodomy and different types of debauchery that were prevalent in the idolatrous practices of the Romans, this was abolished over time. Um, the gladiatorial games. so there was no gladiatory games that which is basically willful willful murder. Um, or, or sort of a grotesque way of punishing criminals for sport. Um, now, the other thing is to, to mention here is that just like every, really every other ancient economy, every ancient economy was basically based on a great number of slaves. Uh, the economy is basically based on a great number of slaves. So uh, slaves were owned either as, as property or just laborers, um, low, lower classes. So a great deal of laborers were the 
the norm for Roman Empire or other ancient cultures. And what Christianity did here was because many people talk about slavery as, you know, we, and we'll talk about this as the way it, it kind of changes later on. Um, but what Christianity did was it undermined the fundamental basis of slavery by abolishing the inequality of man. And the way that it did this, because slavery was based on, at least in, in sort of its its uh, fallen aspect, because you, you could become a slave, you know, if you were a captive in a war or things of that nature, or if you were a criminal, things of that nature, which there's there some sort of justice, at least to some extent, in this in this slavery Um at least as it was thought, but there was also in terms of a slave being a lower class citizen because he was some sort of inferior nature, that concept was abolished with the Christian message. So the, the, the epistle of Philemon, Philemon, uh, St. Paul writes to this man named Philemon about his slave Onesimus. And he, St. Paul actually sends Onesimus, the slave back to Philemon because he had run away. And he says, accept him as a brother. And, you have Onesimus actually becomes a saint, and he gets or he gets consecrated as a bishop. So you have this slave consecrated as a bishop, and that's really the way that the Christian Christianity undermined the concept of slavery was not by leading a revolution that was a bloody, violent revolution against slavery. The method of the church was always a gradual adoption of these social mores. So with idolatry and things of that nature, there was a, a much swifter attack on these practices. But with things like slavery, where you have a, a, an institution embedded in the very fact of, fabric of the economy, where, you know, basically people's food were, I mean, everybody's food was essentially determined by this mass of slaves. And we're going to talk, I mean, we can talk later about the economic ramifications of, of a bloody revolution. But basically what the church did was it abolished the basic concept that the slave was of an inferior nature. Because as I said, Onesimus is a slave. He gets consecrated a bishop. You know, you could be a bishop. You could be a priest as a slave in the Catholic church. And that's what made it subversive as well, because people were viewing this as this sort of lower class religion where these slaves were becoming Christians and they were thought to be the same of the same nature as everyone else. And so that is the way that the church abolished slavery for the first time. The church abolished slavery twice. There's, so we're going to talk about the first ab abolition of slavery, and that came about through a gradual adoption of Christian morals and Christian theology into the ba basic social understanding of, of what it means to be a human person. And we'll talk about how that changed things because slavery persisted, but a slave was not seen as an inferior, at least to the point where Christians were being imbued with this Christian gospel. So um, keep that in mind. We're going to talk a little bit about how that creates a feudal system later on. Um, but and I'm passing over things again. You can add what you what you'd like, more details on the slavery question. Um, but that's a little bit more complex. There's more to it. But I mentioned in just, just a few minutes ago about the tension between the Christian states and the allegiance to a state, a particular state, and the kingdom of God overall. So first of all, you have the tension between the Persian Christians and the Roman Christians, especially because the Persians and the Roman Christians were at odds. They were fighting. There was a, there was a civil, not a civil war, but there was a war between the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire. And so the Christians in Persia were trying to pay allegiance to Persia, but they were also trying to be Christians with their brothers in Rome. And so there was a an attempt as well to distance themselves from the Roman Christians. And there was all these political tensions as well. Um, there were, on the outskirts of the empire, you had the Egyptians, you had the Syrians um, bordering this Persian empire. And a lot of the divisions that happen, especially in the 400s, happen along these political lines. So first of all, you have 431, the Council of Ephesus, which is where Nestorius is condemned. Now Nestorius is condemned rightly, but what happens is he goes to the Persian Christians, and the Persian Christians do not have the same terms that are used in Greek in the Roman Empire. And so they don't recognize him as a heretic. They don't understand that he was a heretic. And there was also this political tension between them and the Roman Church. And so they accept Nestorius, um, and there's a great deal of scholarship, which is 
I, I guess not a not enough scholarship, but there is this entire Christian church that stretches from you know Baghdad all the way to Japan. I think uh, I guess I don't have the book ready at hand, but uh, the the big book on that is is the Lost History of Christianity by Philip Jenkins. So there's this whole Christian church that spreads all the way to Japan and is later reconciled to Rome in around 1300. And so there, there is, so in many ways we can consider a great deal of this church to be Catholic, even though they were separated because of all these political situations. And Nestorius was a heretic, but there's also a problems with the terminology, which was resolved later uh, when this church was reconciled to Rome. So, but the point is, is that these divisions break along these political lines. Uh, so after that, you have 451 Chalcedon, which is another division between these outskirts of the empire, which speak a different different forms of, of Greek, like Coptic and uh, Syriac, where they have, and Armenia actually comes into this, where they really have political differences as well as theological differences. And again, a lot of this can was resolved later on when Copts were uh, many... Not, not really a sliver of their whole population, but still a, a significant number were reconciled to Rome when they were able to basically work out the fact that their language was communicating a different terminology for the same substance of doctrine. So this, the tension, basically, this is, this is showing that there, there is a strong tension between these political loyalties and the... Uh, political loyal, the political loyalty innate towards the kingdom of God, where we're all Christians, we're all brothers, and at the same time, we also have these earthly kingdoms that we also pay allegiance to in a, a subordinate way. And so these tensions really shake Christianity and really cause this great division. So in the 5th fifth, fifth century, as I said, you have these two huge divisions in the East, which still persist today. So there's these three different divisions. So there's the, you have the Assyrian church, you have the non-Chalcedonians or the Coptic or Oriental Orthodox, and then you have the Eastern Orthodox today, which represents the, the rest of the Roman Empire. So they have these three warring factions in the East. And also the Persian Empire is also making war on the Roman Empire, especially, I believe it's in the next century. So in the 500s. Now, meanwhile, in the West... The, the Rome, as Rome, the city, fell to the, the barbarians in 410. So the barbarians in the West adopt the Arian heresy. And so they're heretics. They're not Christians. And they take over Rome. They basically establish a political dominance in the West. And this is going to become the key, the very key factor that, that splits East and West, basically. Um, so basically you have the Pope of Rome who is technically a Roman citizen. So he's technically the, the Pope, the Roman Christians, the Orthodox Christians in Rome and also in Spain are technically citizens of the Roman empire whose emperor is in Constantinople. So the, I believe it's 478, if I'm rec recalling correct, uh, correctly, the last Western Roman emperor. Because we, at this time, that you had two different emperors, one in the West, one in the East. And eventually, the Western Empire falls. There's no emperor in the West. And there's just one emperor, and he's in the East. He's in Constantinople, or a.k.a. New Rome. And so, so technically, you, you basically, so you have this, these Romans who are Roman citizens, and they are members of the Roman Empire whose emperor is in Constantinople. But you have all these barbarian tribes who are Aryan heretics. And what's interesting is that these barbarians actually want to become Romans. They, they think it's cool to be Roman, basically. So they want to come over and they want to keep their, their, um, they want to keep their Aryan heresy and they want to become Romans. So they want to become the more Western emperors. So that's sort of their ambition. But the Pope is stalwart Orthodox, refuses to compromise one iota with these Aryan barbarians. And instead, a long effort is made to convert all the Western pagan tribes, um, or Aryan tribes, that is. And so this effort is nearly a thousand years long, uh, even, even more than that, you could say. So 
it goes from, I mean, we could say the fall of four, of Rome for 410 all the way to the conversion of Latvia in 1348. So this process goes a very long time where the West is just working to convert all these barbarians to the faith. And that's going to be a key to this whole story. Um, because what happens is in the East, gradually the political loyalties begin to break down between the East and the West. And the biggest reason for this is really that a lot of the Eastern emperors were heretics. So there were these new heresies because the Eastern emperor was always trying to reconcile these heretical movements um, and these other, these three divisions that these big divisions that were in the East, he was always trying to reconcile them and try to compromise with heresy. And the Pope never compromised and refused to compromise. We could maybe talk about Hernorius, but 99% of the time, the Pope did not compromise one bit with the Eastern heretics. And what you had was over and over and over, you had the Eastern emperor trying to control the Western Christians with heresy. So you had the Roman emperor in the East coming to the West or trying to enforce in the West, trying to enforce his heresy. Meanwhile, they're basically with a bunch of barbarians, so they don't really have a lot of political power. Justinian retakes the West. He reestablishes the Western emperor empire, but then he tries to control the Pope and this really ends in disaster. And eventually um, you have St. Gregory the Great. Now he is the, he is looked as the first medieval Pope. Now, before we talk about medieval, I want to say one thing about that. I don't use the term medieval. I don't like the term. And the reason is because it is a pejorative. It was invented by the enemies of Christ, meaning the middle time, the, the time between the early time and the enlightenment, basically the enlightenment when everything was great. So we, we threw out the middle ages, which were just this terrible time and created this great new world. So the middle ages, I, I may say so-called middle ages, but I prefer to use the, the term Christian era. It's really the Christian era where the Christian church is working to dominate culture and, and dominate society and dominate it for Christ the King. Was it perfect? Uh, no. Was doesn't have serious flaws and serious problems? Yes. Uh, many problems, many issues, tons of them. But the church was at the center of culture, and the church was working always to reform that culture. So I don't like to use the term medieval, um, but what you have with St. Gregory the Great is you have what he begins to do is he begins to shift the political power of the pope to the west to his he begins to make his own political decisions about the politics of his region on his own authority now this you could trace this even further back to maybe saint leo the great but saint gregory the great really starts to make he starts to make treaties with these western barbarians uh, apart from the eastern empire emperor who's more or less a heretic from from now um uh now and again he's he's a heretic you know kind of every other emperor i mean there's basically um to look it up there's a there, the percentage of time that the eastern emperor was a heretic is a great deal there, there's a great percentage um of that and so you have these problems with the east where they're continually um let me see if i can look that up over the course of the 464 years from Constantine to the Seventh Ecumenical Council, so basically about from 325 to 787, um, the Eastern bishops were heretical and out of communion with Rome for at least 203 years. So you have almost 50% of the time the Eastern bishops and emperor, more or less, were in heresy and schism with Rome, whereas Rome was always Orthodox. And so you have this tension that continues to build with again and again, these Roman emperors try to dominate the Pope and force him to be a her heretic. And eventually the Pope just says, no, we're, we're done with the Roman emperor empire basically. And so that's really what starts with St. Gregory the Great. He starts making these treaties with the, with the barbarians. He starts um, doing this on his own authority. So he's basically acting as a Roman uh, emperor in some sense by making these treaties apart from permission from the emperor. So he's making these political moves on his own authority. And that's what really brings, brings out this new state of things. Now, 
when it really comes to a head is in 754. Now, in that in that year, you have the creation of the Papal States, and that's when there was an agreement struck between the the Pope of Rome and the barbarian tribes, specifically the Franks. And basically the Franks agreed to basically be the protector of the Pope and the Roman Church and give the Roman Church the Papal States for their own. So at this time, the Pope actually becomes a political leader in reality, de jure. So in the law, the Pope becomes basically the monarch of this Papal State, which is essentially its own realm where he can exercise his own political authority. And the Papal States continue until 1870. And this is going to be a, a crucial point. The, so the Papal States are what makes the Pope not, at least in theory, not bound to any political entity. The, since the Pope has his own country, so to speak, even though countries per se were not really invented at that time, but he has his own realm. And so he's not trying to conquer another realm like again, like the Mohammedans, he's not trying to have one, one person, one ruler, one religious re- ruler, one political ruler. He's not trying to have that. So, so what you have in 754, the Papal States, um, and this gets solidified in the year 800 when Charlemagne is crowned by the Pope. And at this time, there was actually no Roman emperor in the East at the time. There was a queen, and he gets crowned Roman emperor. So we have a restoration of the Roman emperor in the West, or the empire, at least in theory again, as, so that's why you have the term, the Holy Roman Emperor. And that's the, Charlemagne gets crowned Emperor of the Romans. And so we have a restoration of the Roman Empire concept in the West, which immediately creates this strong tension, obviously, with the other emperor in the East. Because remember, remember there hadn't been an emperor in the West since 478. So there used to be two emperors, but obviously the Eastern emperor of the Romans was getting pretty used to the fact that he was the only emperor. But now you have two emperors now. You have, so you have Charlemagne and this is really the tension that really eventually causes the split between the East and the West because, because of these political loyalties, it exacerbates the existing theological and liturgical differences between the East and the West and eventually causes a split. Now, as an aside, the the Great Schism of the East and West did not occur in 1054, that's usually the date, but it occurred very gradually over time, and especially during the Crusades, um, 1204, the sack of Constantinople, um, especially in the failure of Florence to win over most of the East. Uh, so that was uh, 14, what was it, 30, I think? Um, that, so that was Florence. So, I mean, we, we can really trace it to the failure of Lyon or Florence maybe, but the, that, that schism happens very gradually. And the, the, really the issues that still exist between the East and the West were present in the West in the 400s. So, so the filioque, the papacy, and things of this, you know, things that uh, Eastern Orthodox today critique Catholicism about, those things were, were there for centuries before 1054. So, the whole schism is very complex. There's a lot of different issues with it. So that's the subject for another video. But that's really the tension. Once again, you had those three different schisms in the East, which broke along these political and cultural barriers. And then you have this East and West schism, which also breaks along political and cultural barriers. So, so now, as this is happening in 800, you have the creation of the feudal culture. Now, as we talked about, the institution of slavery was abolished in its ideology. So no man could say that a slave was an inferior man, an inferior person, sort of some sort of inferior. Um, and even also, we may also speak of, because we're going to talk about feminism as well, because the, the place of women also was secured, especially through the cult of the Virgin Mary. Um, Things like indissoluble male marriage, uh, which was a protection for women and children, um, and against divorce, um, 
as I said, we talked about wife murder, but the place of women was secured as an, as an, um, e- women were viewed as having equal nature and equal dignity with men. Um, so there was this very strong equality in the, the basic theolog- theology, but there was a very strong hierarchy as well between the different uh, classes in society. But there was a strong culture that, that the, as I said, during the Christian era, the so-called Middle Ages, during the Christian era, the Christian church was able to imbue a very strong Christian culture into this social hierarchy. And so the slaves uh, were given rights, they were given protections, they were given insurance, security. So basically you had this, this feudal society um, coming into, f- into form, and, and a f- the feudal society was divided into three different classes. It was called those who work, those who fight, and those who pray. And those three classes were basically made up society. So essentially, the, it, was, it was based on subsidiarity, which is where the basic village, where most of the people in the village were laborers. And so, and these were the former slaves. Now, these slaves had become more serfs or penitents. And the reason for that is that a slave... A slave, per se, has an inferior nature. He's owned his property, and he can be killed. And so the the serf, or the peasant, does not have an inferior nature. He can become a priest. Uh, he cannot be killed. He has rights. If he dies, um, the, the Lord has a duty to provide for his wife and children until they die. So there's an insurance. Um, the laborer now, however, the laborer has the duty to provide the food for the community so that you have the second class of people which are those who fight and those who fight are the knights the the people who protect the village and they have to spend their time training for battle and so these are the nobles so these people their job was to rule over society and protect society from the invading vikings and other forces and so what you have is the those who fight are those people who they're charged with security with with securing the community and then they so the laborers have a duty to provide food for the community so the the fighters then can eat and they can spend their time not laboring but uh training for battle but then the the fighters they have a duty to protect the laborers and so they have, there's, there's this interdependence. Now, there's the third class of people, which are those who pray. And the, those who pray, obviously, are the monks and the priests. And they don't do battle. And they don't labor in the fields. They labor in the monasteries. And they pray um, for the community. And that was the sort of this tripartite classification of society. Now, it need to be, needs to be stressed that if you are a feudal serf, a peasant, you basically work especially in the summer and then you have a great deal of rest in the winter because you're not bringing in the harvest and you also have a day off on every holy day and so a serf basically worked less than i do or that a common middle class person they they had they didn't have a weekend per se but they had the holy days so you have um two or three days off per week every day every week of the year basically with all these the sundays and the holy days off and then they also had this insurance. So there's no homeless per se. There was no uh, poor per se in the sense that in a, in a small village, now in the cities is a different matter, but in a small village, you're going to have the people working together and this interdependency. Now, all of this to say this was the ideal. So this was when the system was working properly, when people had a basic cultural mindset and there was a strong culture, but there was a great deal of brutality because these were all barbarians and the church was trying to convert them to be Christian men. And one of the ways the church did that was, one, um, one was with the Crusades, and one was with the peace and truce of God. So one of the things that the church did, which this is kind of humorous, but you have to understand that these barbarians are just these, these basically street rapists, and they're just these terrible human beings, and then they become Christian. So what do you do with these aggressive, crazy people? Well, the truce of God and the peace of God was basically this, this cultural form, again, the church working gradually to convert these pagan barbarians. And the truce of God and the peace of God were basically times during the week and times during the year where it was forbidden to fight. 
And so the church in, was promoting this and, and imposing this on the populace to basically cut down on the, on the brutality and violence. And so this was um, a gradual implement, implementation of a Christian culture, which was not abolishing fighting altogether because the church in her wisdom knew that the, these barbarians couldn't handle that. So they were slowly cutting down on the brutality and the violence. And so what you have is the, the rising of the concept of chivalry. So you have the, the knight in shining armor is this quintessential man who is a knight who fights for his lady, fights for the church. He spares the innocent. He protects the innocent. He's, he's merciful. Um, and he fights against the infidel. So then you have the Crusades, which is where the church was essentially attempting to take back the Christian lands that had been taken over by the Mohammedans and essentially more or less reunite East and West into one big Christian empire. But, and we'll get into this, what happens is this fails. And the reason it fails is basically because of Christian disunity, because all these Christian princes are trying to fight against each other. They're trying to make, uh, get more land, their, their ambitions. Uh, so this is really what really hits that united effort and, and makes it eventually just die out and never really gain foothold except in Spain. That's the only really lasting crusade that lasts and is successful as the Reconquista in Spain. So that's um, really ends in 1492. So the crusades, as we usually talk about them, uh, ultimately were a failure, unfortunately, because they did not complete and, and make a lasting Christian empire in the East. And today the Mohammedans still rule in the East. So um, the other thing about this is that the Christian era was a limited monarchy. Now you, there were some places that had republics, republics. So like the kingdom of Florence was a republic um, or different republics uh, that existed. And they were all very small republics, just a city where, you know, people were voting or whatever, but there was very small. And the same thing goes for the monarchies. Now the monarchies at the time were very limited monarchs. What that means is you had, you had, we talked about the, the feudal village. Well, an entire realm was based on a great deal of feudal villages. So you had, you know, a hundred feudal villages in the kingdom of France or whatever. So each of these, so there was a Lord, there was a feudal Lord so he was the ruler of a village and he was the leader of the nobles who were those who fight. So he's the, the fighting class. So his job, if the village is attacked, is to bring, to lead the knights out from the village to attack the, and repel the invaders. Because at this time, the church was working on converting the Vikings. So they were the most vicious of the pagan uh, barbarians that were constantly coming to destroy and rape and pillage all the villagers. And so you had that that fighting class to defend it. Now, the limited monarchy was the king of France or, or Holy Roman Emperor or whatever. Um, the, the king had, so these lords would pledge their fealty to the king. So they pledged an oath to the king and said, if you call on us to fight for you, we'll fight for you. And that was this oath that they swore to him and that was his power. So his job was then to, if the whole realm was attacked, then he would call up all the knights to defend the realm. And that was his, really his biggest power was calling on all these knights to defend the realm. And so the limited, these, these limited monarchs are not what we're, we're going to discuss later, the absolute monarchs, where we talk about... Um, the King Louis and, and King George III, you know, the American Revolution, those were absolute monarchs. They had a massive amount of power over a, a state. Whereas in the, in the Christian era, in the so-called medieval era, the monarchs had much less power. They had a, a much limited, um, the, the, they had a realm, um, but their power, and they may have taxes and whatnot, but their power was much more limited than what it was later on. Um, and this is where we talk about subsidiarity. That's where we see this in this society where there is a great deal of subsidiarity because each village basically rules itself. Um, you don't really have a central bureaucracy, even in that king 
who's ruling the whole realm. He doesn't really rule that village. He doesn't really, he's not really that concerned with that village. And now, obviously, I'm talking generalities here, so we're skipping through over a lot of details here. But the central bureaucracy and the kingdom, the king is not ruling he doesn't have a, the, a direct rule over that feudal village. It's really the, the lord, who's the local ruler that's subsidiarity. So the local guy is calling the shots in that local community. And so that's really that subsidiarity, or as you see that for that uh, medieval, uh, so-called medieval era. Um, another thing, I'm going to have to wrap this up. We're not even going to get into the investiture controversy. Um but the other thing I wanted to talk about was the basic economic structure. So we talked about how the slave class, the class of slaves, was slavery was being abolished in its very essence, in the sense that you couldn't own a slave in the sense that this person is property because he's an inferior nature. Um, now, peasants were not allowed to just run off because they were formed a part of that fealty that the... the um, duties and rights and duties of that society but as you can see that feudal society there wasn't interdependence so the those who fight they were nobles and they were rulers and they didn't have to work you know they didn't have to work in the fields but they had a duty to lay, put their life on the line if they if necessary and so their job was to rule for the sake of the laborers and for their sake and that's why you have the christian authority christian authority is given to the rulers for the sake of the populace, so that the ruler may rule for the sake of the populace. Um, there's one other aspect of it that I wanted to discuss, and that is usury, um, because this is going to be a very big topic as it develops in the second millennium, um, because usury is probably, besides m strictly moral questions of uh, murder and sexual morals and things of that nature, um, usury is one of the most condemned things in the history of the church in terms of social issues. And usury, I don't have time to go into all of it, but basically usury is still condemned. It's actually in the New Catechism. It's still condemned in the New Catechism. So people often go around and, and think that usury is... The church changed her teaching on usury. That's not true. The church did not change her teaching on usury. Um, the issue is that Usury is essentially, it is interest paid on a loan without a just title. Interest paid on a loan without a just title. Now, what that means is that all usury is interest, but not all interest is usury. Because there can be fees or interest tied to a loan if you have a just title. Now, what, what do I mean by just title? A just title means basically you have a right to some compensation. And so what you have is in these, this Christian era, you have this class of people called the usurers. And the usurers essentially were mainly Jews. So for, first of all, this is just a historical fact. I'm not saying Jews are bad. I'm just saying the Jews were the usurers. They were, that's what they were doing. Um, and... You had rulers who, went because they were avaricious, they wanted to get richer, get more powerful, and they would let these Jews inside, inside their villas or villages or realms or whatever, and the Jews would then lend to them at usury. And what, I mean, what do I mean by usury? I mean 30% interest. It's basically like a credit card today. Um, and it's compounding interest. And this type of interest, by and large, is without a just title. Um, it's interest without a just title. It's usury. It's wrong. It's evil. And so what you have is the Jews basically creating usurious uh, contracts with other people and making them into slaves to usury. And the church constantly condemned this over and over and over. And so that's why it's a very important issue that we need to address and we need to face that because it is a serious issue interest without a just title. And so what happened was the church, instead of uh, sort of to, com to combat the usurers, the church set up what's called the Mons Pietatis, which is, it was the, it's, um, the, the Mount of Piety, um, which was a charitable organization which gave out loans to people who needed them, who were poor, 
And, and that's why usury especially is so heinous because it's oppression of the poor. It's saying this guy needs money and he's poor. And so we're going to lend to him, but ask him 30% interest or more. And that's usury. And, but the Mons Pietatis gave out loans, but they did charge a fee. And the fee was designed to cover their expenses for their employees. And so this was not understood to be usury. It was, it was strictly, strictly regulated by the church so that these, you, these contracts were not usurious. And that's where you get the, the just title, where they're charging interest per se. It is interest. But it is with a just title. So you're asking for compensation to pay your workers to give you that loan. And so that's where that came in. Now, that's going to be one of the biggest issues that starts things really going south quickly as we continue in the history of Catholic politics. So you have this feudal society, but there are these usurers, and the church is strictly condemning them. But then a disaster strikes, and that is what's called pejoratively, but in reality it's called the first pornocracy. And this is where a number of very terrible popes were being elected, and this is in the 900s. And this is going to come to a head, especially with Pope John the Twelfth. This pope toasted Satan, invoked pagan gods, was a terrible, immoral character, and the Roman populace rebelled against him and called upon the emperor in the West to depose John the Twelfth. And this will be will give us will bring us into the next section of our history, which is the investiture controversy, which will eventually explode into the Great Western Schism which will lead directly to the Reformation, which will dramatically change the political landscape of the Christian era and shatter Christendom and shatter these, these social constructions of culture that we've discussed about the feudal village, um, the condemnation of usury, and all sorts of things like that. So that'll shatter this whole process and eventually lead directly to the modern secular state. So, um, But it's already been an hour, so we, we, we are out of time. So we're going to have to pause on that history. We're going to pause on John the 12th, 900s. The Roman populace rebels against him, ask the Pope to depose him. So we'll talk about what happens next in the next installment of history of Catholic politics. So thanks so much for watching or listening. Um, please like and subscribe. If you, if Please uh, say a prayer for our apostolate that this may be for the greater glory of God and the salvation of souls. If you have any means, please support us. Become a patron. Um, that helps me be a father and help uh, pr support and provide for my family. So I appreciate that. Um, and uh, I'm not sure how frequently I'll be able to make videos or podcasts. My wife is about to give birth. So please pray, pray, say a prayer for her. Um, and uh, so we'll continue. We'll continue to talk about politics. I'm going to do, a, I think, these solo shows for a while just because I can't. It's hard for me to schedule things with guests right now because of the baby coming. So that's what we're going to be working on right now. Uh, send me all your questions or additional historical details you want to add to this presentation. Um, there's a lot to go over. There's a lot of different details. And um, I don't want to be too one way or the other and try to try to present this as objectively as possible. So, um Anything that I've gotten wrong here, please point out to me any, any additional details I'm missing that are pertinent. So please comment uh, on those things. Uh, send me all your questions as much as we can, and we'll try to go over those. But for now, let's pray for, uh, in America, our coming election in uh, America. Um, let's pray for Christ the King to rule in every nation and for justice uh, for the poor, justice for workers, um, justice especially for the unborn, that they may be protected, that all laws which permit their willful murder may be repealed and they may be given the protection that is theirs by right, and they may be given baptism. So let's pray for uh, all of these politics, that these, these politics, these questions may be resolved, and, and especially charity and truth may reign between Catholics as we discern and, and debate about these political matters and work out the best way to rule according to Christ's law. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but to the first evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.